Welcome back, guys, to the Social Standard Podcast. Today's guest is Rashad Tabakawala. He is a pioneer in the agency digital marketing world, and he has spent over 37 years at Publicis, advising some of the top brands in the world on exactly how to reinvent themselves and grow their businesses. Uh, he's now an author. With his latest book is Restoring the Soul of Business, Staying Human in the Age of Data. And he also, in his spare time, is an advisor and an educator. So, Rashad, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. Um, anything that I left out there in that bio? No, thank you very much. I think that's a handful enough. <laughs> very cool. Well, um, I got to say, I'm excited to talk to you today. Uh, as we were discussing before, I just recently read your book, um, and I've perused several of your Substack articles as well. Um, so some really great content out there if our, if our listeners haven't checked it out. Um, but I am really just incredibly impressed with how eloquently you deliver simple solutions to widespread problems of marketing and growing the business in a digital age. So for me, it's always a pleasure to be around people with um, such great experience and such calm ability to crystallize some of the problems that we face as business leaders and marketers today. Um, so well, just excited to have you. Well, thank you. I try to simplify without dumbing down. <laughs> that, that, you know, simple is not easy. And I think, you know, a lot of a lot of the marketing um, juggernauts like Google and Apple have really showed us that simple is important, but it's it's not always easy. Exactly. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of dive in a little bit today and I really want to look at um, a lot of the things that you study and, and you've had experience with. But I want to look at it through the lens of digital marketing and social media, social media, you know, I mean, it's it's a very big piece of the digital pie now, right? I think if you go back five, 10 years, it was something that CMOs probably didn't have too much exposure to. But now I would venture to say it's a big part of their daily, weekly conversations with their team. And I think social media moves so quickly, right? So it's now transforming, again, the way that I've seen it, um, from social media to really entertainment media, right? So you have YouTube, which has been entertainment the entire time. You also got TikTok, which has blown up in the last year and a half. Um, and they claim to be the number one entertainment app uh, really in the, in the app store. And then you've got Instagram, who recently announced that, hey, we are no longer a photo sharing app. We're now going full-fledged into video. So entertainment is now king. And it just makes me really sort of sit back and think about how do, how do these trends, how can we overlay these trends to some of the trends that have happened in different types of marketing historically like television or print or radio, right? Look, what can we learn from those channels to, I guess, improve what we're doing in the digital and social space, right? Are we really, have we really just done TV 2.0, but now it is trackable and you can engage with it real time? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you see a lot of overlay or do you think we're just in a totally different era? So I believe there is some overlay and it's also more of a totally different era. And I wrote a piece and you had mentioned my uh, thought letter is the way I call it because yeah. it's not really a newsletter and uh, which I write every week. And I wrote a piece called Ruptures in the Mediascape. And that speaks very clearly to what you have rightly seen. And I have highlighted five ruptures um, and uh, one of them is what I call the mongrelization of media, okay. which is you used to be able to, before digital, you separated certain things. You separated video and audio and print. So there were video mediums, audio mediums, and print mediums. And then as digital became around, it was hard to separate video and audio and print. But then we started separating them into things like discovery, e-commerce, social, mobile. I now propose that even those definitions make no sense. Yep. So you, you know, alluded to TikTok, Instagram. They are e-commerce engines, they are discovery engines, they mostly take place on mobile phones uh, or mobile devices. They're social engines. So what are they? So I call that the mongrelization of media. <laughs> and it, so yeah. that's the first big shift, which has been driven greatly by these social 
platforms, if that's what you call them. Yep. The second big shift is what I believe is the thing that is the most dramatic and what makes this a slightly different entertainment medium, though an entertainment media, which is what is a media company and who is a creative? Mm -hmm. So in the old world, a media company was someone who basically had distribution. Right. Right. Now, increasingly, a media company is somebody who has demand. So I remind people that Kylie Kardashian yep. gets more people to interact with her than those who interacted with the Super Bowl and Oscars combined. That's right. So Kylie Kardashian is a media company. She has 120 million Instagram followers. So she's a media company. But she's also a creator. So she's a, both a creative company and a media company because she has demand. So Absolutely. That's what we call influencers, right? Right. And so what now has basically happened is there was this thing about influencers, and I was a big believer in influencers, but it felt like whenever people thought about influence, they thought that these people were being famous for being influential, right? Mm. While I suggested that they were being famous not just because they were influential, but because they had perspectives, points of view, and they were actually creators. They were makers. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the big, this big shift is in the old world, the media companies, which had distribution, decided to select who the creators were. Now the creators who have demand and influence decide that they are the media companies of the future. And that is the dramatic difference from what used to be to what is. So in this ruptures in the media scape, mongolization of media, as well as who is a creative company and who's a distribution company. A third one, which also very, very ties into, but it's not as clear why it ties into, is what I call the uh, third and fourth are two which you might think have got nothing to do with influencer and social, but have everything to do with influencer and social, okay. if you look at it the right way, which is the rise of the years versus the rise of the eyes. So what do I mean? Right now, what are we doing? We're recording a podcast. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. We listen to these things in cars. We use voice as an interface. Clubhouse, at least for a time, was rising. That's right. So in effect, we keep thinking about media being about the eyes, but media is becoming about the years. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, podcasting is a medium that allows influencers to yeah. now engage in long form content, which they could not before. Yes, 100%. Right? I'm so glad to hear you say that because I've been trying to convince people that podcasters are influencers in the same way. Podcasters are absolutely influencers in the same way. And so three of my five big media ruptures are all about what you work in. Mm -hmm. The fourth and fifth are connected, but not necessarily central, but they're connected but in different ways. The fourth is I believe that the old medium of radio, television, print, and newspaper um, are being rapidly displaced. So they've been, we've already seen the displacement of newspapers. We've mm -hmm. seen the displacement of magazines. You know, to a great extent, the new Condé Nast is Instagram. Yeah. Okay. Um, radio has been displaced in some combination of streaming, Spotify, podcasting, but it's still strong, but it's not been as displaced. And television is figuring it out, you know, which is ad supported television is in decline. Not television is in decline, but ad supported television is in decline. Uh, but the medium that is risen from the old to the new is out of home. Okay. Mm -hmm. So out-of-home media, because out-of-home media has been helped by technology. Yeah, What used true. to be boards has become screens. What used to be unconnected has become wirelessly wired. And guess what social influencers like seeing themselves? Yeah. They love seeing themselves on a big board, up in the television, in the bar. Of course. Right? That's like the gold standard, right? For them, yes. they've made it when they've done the, the traditional stuff. When they've done that. and so out, But out-of-home allows me, even when I'm in let's say Times Square, if I'm standing in the right place and doing the right thing, to yep. be on one of those boards. 
But out of home is rising, and obviously social connects best with out of home. Yeah. In in some form. And the last one really is the increasing um, importance of privacy. Uh, well, my sort of fifth one. And the increasing importance of privacy, the reason it's becoming important is less because of what I why I think privacy is important, because I believe privacy is important because when you are not yourself when somebody is watching. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think it's a human right, which people Agreed. think, right? But the reason it's become important is because business models are clashing. And so Zuckerberg and and Sundar Pichai and Tim Cook are going at it, not because they care about anybody, frankly. They care no. about their business models. Of course. That's their duty to their shareholders, and yeah. anyone can you know, right. fault them for that. A- and to a great extent, they are all those companies are also now wrangling and speaking about creators. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, YouTube for the first time lost naming rights to Witcon, yeah. That's to right. TikTok. Mm-hmm. That's right? a big deal. Absolutely. Our friend, Mr. Zuckerberg, is constantly talking creator, 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 right? Yep. With bullshit things like the bulletin and other things that he's mm-hmm. put out. Okay. Exactly. But he's yep. basically talking that way. And at the same time, Sundar Pichai and others are saying, wait a second, we got to make sure that the TikTokians of the world don't take away the YouTubians, right, mm-hmm. of the world. Yep. So the privacy thing has actually also somewhat connected into the social you know, sphere. Uh, so all the five ruptures, three of them are central social sure. and two of them are sort of connected. So I do believe that, getting back to your you know, question, uh, I truly think that what we have to sort of think about is this is the future of everything. It's entertainment. And I read somewhere that in the United States today, 50 million people think of themselves as creators. Wow. Okay. And this number in 2017 was about 16 or 17 million. But it's gone to 50 million because a couple of new things have come since then. Right? The whole TikTok thing has happened. Yep. Right? Which has made a lot of new creators, as well as things like Substack and podcasting. Mm-hmm. All of those really have taken off in the last three, four years. Absolutely. Uh, even though podcasting was around for a long time, but it's, they've taken off in the last three, four years. Yep. So all of those have become creator. And I remind people when I speak to people, when I go to these boardrooms, and I say, you might know me, right, as someone who ran strategy for an 80,000 person company worldwide, okay, and who started a lot of stuff. But I am now a creator. Yeah. Okay. So I said, I've written a book. Mm -hmm. I actually host a podcast for a company called, you know, for my own company called What Next, which will, I mean, for my old company, which will soon be out in the world. I write a Substack that I both through subscription and pass along readership and being syndicated in both Media Village and Adweek is read by 30,000 people, right? So I said, hey, if a person who used to do mathematics and has the imagination of a toilet bowl can become a creator, <laughs> watch out. <laughs> yeah, but absolutely. Yes, right? absolutely. I think I, I've been calling this the um, the democratization of entertainment and media, yes. right? I mean, that's, that's sort of the way that I look at it because I think I've seen a lot of similar trends as you, but obviously looking through it, the influencer world, you know, five years ago, four or five years ago, we started talking about micro-influencers, which are the tiny influencers, right? Um, the people who don't have a million plus followers, they might have 50,000, 20,000, whatever it is, right? So, you know, by that definition, you yourself are a micro-influencer. So we would say Exa- absolutely, right? E- e- exactly. And, and, you know, as has been written, like, you know, whether it was first, hey, you know, you can build a successful business with a thousand followers, you know, and now people say, hey, you can do it, do it if you've got a hundred fervent followers, you can do something, yeah. right? Many folks have basically sort of done that. And the big difference also now is that the ability to curate has moved from the person to the algorithm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so now what people are saying is we care less about any Q of iTunes we care more about the TikTok algorithm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's discovery. I mean, but the discovery has been uh, what's plagued most digital companies. I think, yes. you know, everyone to Amazon, to Netflix, 
Um, even, you know, iTunes finding podcasts is, is still pretty hard. You find that through word of mouth. So, yeah, I, I mean, the reality of it is if Apple could do it, they would s start all over again yeah. because their discovery is about as bad as any discovery can be. It is. Yeah. So what they've done is the elegance of their devices and their software is balanced by the inelegance of their discovery. That's true. Yeah, I guess I hadn't really considered it from that standpoint, but 100%. I think that's why you see Spotify taking off so well, right? I mean, discovery on Spotify is just curation, discovery, everything Everything audio is, I yes. think, their mission, right? And they've done a brilliant job on it. I think we even, we host our podcast, of course, on you know iTunes, but Spotify is what we link to in every single one of our social outputs. So, No, and, and, and the thing of making it relatively simple. So, for instance... Someone reached out to me and said, you know, you have some good content and we will work with you to build like podcasts. So I said, OK, I just want to give you a couple of thoughts. One is I do a more professional podcast. That's the reason I have this piece of equipment here. That's right. OK, I said I do a professional podcast where there's a podcasting team and I'm the host. But, mm -hmm. you know, I do that. And I said, then the less professional one is I literally press a button on Anchor and okay. they basically take my work, the, my the stuff I write every Sunday I also put it on WordPress besides Substack. On WordPress, when I put it in there, it automatically anchor comes in. I give it permission and they make a Spotify podcast and then they distribute it across Spotify and all these mm -hmm. other places. Mm -hmm. Right. And so my whole thing is I press a button. Why do I need you? Right. OK. And, and obviously I need them if they were. But I have professionals helping sure. me on other sides. Of course. But but the, the reality of it is that is that's really dramatic. And then the other big impact of, of social is a lot of what I've tried to get people to understand. And this is something, and I sp have spoken to everything from TikTok to Twitter to Facebook, that what we have to understand is a lot of the monetization models were built around something that you know only too well, which is advertising. Mm -hmm. And so Google and Facebook and YouTube and everything were built as advertising operating systems. But what happened is all of us human beings decide to use it for ourselves. Yep. And it became, without us knowing, a society operating system. Yes, absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. Elections are made, people are celebrated, yep. discovered, killed because of this. Mm -hmm. So now we have a society operating system that is being trying to be optimized by an advertising operating system. <laughs> And that is what the conflict is. And if one doesn't step yep. back and says, this is the philosophical divide we have, which is what was started to be advertising now runs society. And therefore, the rules of how you consider these cannot be only limited to advertising. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, and that's a great point because, you know, you rewind even two years ago, but really I would say probably more like five to seven, Facebook and Facebook as part of Instagram. And, you know, YouTube was really the only platform that cared about creators yeah. right they understood it quickly and i think that's that's really given the longevity they're the only ones that where creators could make money on the yeah. platform and they could make it consistently right no one else has cared about that and, and really even five years ago you if you were an influencer on youtube or on instagram or on facebook you couldn't move your audience it was very hard to move an audience with you but now so easy now, it may yes. not be to the scale of like your original audience, but because creators can basically pick up their audience and move their audience with them wherever they go, now, instead of them being beholden to the platforms, the platforms are now beholden to them. And here yes. comes the creator economy. And, and, and the pressure will climb and climb and climb. So for instance, yeah. the little unknown thing about Bulletin, besides nobody being there on Bulletin at the current right. time, exactly, is the fact that uh, while you own the list, on bulletin, which is something that Facebook normally doesn't allow people to do, you actually, if you take the list, you don't own the billing system. So you, if you have subscribers, you're going to have to have them re-enter credit card, um. right? Because, and that's the little trick that little Mr. Zuki Buki has put in there, okay? That's smart. That won't mm -hmm. stand, but that won't stand because people are going to basically say bullshit to you. Now, what happens is he claims he's got a billion people, etc. but there are lots of other places now people can scale. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's going to have to give. And just like, you know, one of the brokers I use is or a brokerage uh, sort of trading platforms I use is called interactive brokers. Okay. And they're more sophisticated, et cetera. But they have this odd thing 
which was they had a $10 fee for inactivity, right? Mm -hmm. So every month they would charge you 10 bucks if you didn't have a certain balance or you were inactive. And, pe and people started leaving them in droves because of Robin Hood and a whole bunch of mm -hmm. stuff. And today they said we, we're dropping it, right? And so there's a new world of competition and therefore a big thing that I constantly am looking for is we always wanna make sure we go back to having competition because competition is good for creators. Absolutely, it's good for everyone. Yeah, Not but it's definitely economy, good for creators so. because if it isn't, then it goes yeah. back to the old days of records. Yeah. Yep, right. Exactly. And we never want to go back there. So those are some of the things to your original question to remember not to go back, right, where yep. we all work for the man. Exactly. Yeah, but that that's so true. And I, I have a whole whole stack of questions for you about yeah. working for the man and that trend right. there. But before we get into that, sure. um, you know, I do think it's I think it's interesting to see this sort of democratization, right? And not working for the man. But what what gives me pause as I think about a lot of our large clients is if you are, let's use Coca-Cola, for example. Okay, it's easy in this old world for you to go to Disney and AT&T and all these big media companies and place your ads and figure this out, right? Facebook, you can do paid. But now, like you're talking about, there are creators who have really passionate audiences and they may only have 10,000 followers, but there are tens of thousands of them. You have all these people on Substack doing all these things. Now, Substack, we know, is yep. not doing advertising, but let's just pretend for a moment. Um, how does... How does a big brand like that hit scale with all of these small individual media properties, right? To me, it's, there's got to be a company, there's, there's got to be an angle here for tech to come in and play. But the problem is, is tech doesn't, that, that has to get buy-in from Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and TikTok and Substack to kind of come all together to be able to place ads across the board. And that's very challenging. Yeah. So there are three or four, those are very challenging things. And, uh, I'm not obviously an expert in this area, but I have some thoughts, uh, sure. and which are areas, and I'm sure there are more solutions than the ones I've named. I've just named a few. So the first, from looking at from like a Coca-Cola's perspective, right, mm -hmm. or companies like that, the first is to look inside and to recognize that if they are, as they are, companies with purpose, mission, values, that they actually live to their purpose, mission, and values. Mm -hmm. Because the influencer does not like inauthenticity. Right. The influencer doesn't like being scammed or fooled. Right. So you have to live the way you talk. Yep. So, you know, make sure you got good products and services, you're doing the right things, etc. So no trickery. Right. Right. Or if you do the trickery, it should be such that everyone sees how good the trick is and you know it's a trick versus right. like, I don't do any tricks and you know I'm like, whatever. So one is for companies to really embrace this whole idea of what I call, you know, uh, purpose, values, you know, yep. ESG, all of that. Lately, I've been thinking about a second ESG. So that's what they have to do. And what, what, is, a, what does ESG so, 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 stand for? So the original ESG is environment, social, and governance. Okay. So environment is how you think about the environment. Sure. You know, like, do you have to have as many plastic, Dasani, you know, all of that, right? Mm -hmm. Social is what are the implications of what you're doing broadly in the social world. Yep. And G is governance. Are you well run, et cetera? Got it. I think... And therefore, a lot of people talk about purpose and values with rela relate relationship to that. All of that is important. There is a second ESG that they have to think about. So that's the first thing they have to do. Then there's okay. a second ESG they have to think of, which is also internal, but internal external. So the original ESG is about how does Coca-Cola think about the environment? How is Coca-Cola mm -hmm. governing itself, et cetera? The next ESG, the E stands for employees. Yes, absolutely. How do you look after your employees? Because to me... Your biggest advocates are happy employees. My, my belief is that the most important thing is not net promoter score, it's employee joy. Hmm. Okay? okay? If you've got employees who are satisfied and happy, you can build a brand and they will speak and they will influence and they yep. become much more real, right? So that's, so that's E. S is society. What are you doing for society? 
like I've always told a company, if you're a company, you believe you're doing something for society, tell me what you're doing to help people get vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and then don't tell me that, by the way, you believe in greater things and you refuse to talk about vaccination because 20% of the U.S. doesn't like that. No, no, sure. no, no, no. Take a stand. Do you yep. believe or you don't believe? So those are the other things they have to do. And then G is government. Are you paying your taxes? How are you working <laughs> with government? Right? So you tell me you are all cool, but you don't pay your taxes, you treat your employees well. Screw your purpose and values and your mission yeah. statements and your website. Yeah. That's right? interesting. Yeah. And, and those two things is what I'm, I go to the boardrooms because this is the CMO runs from these things. They don't oh, want to yeah. do talk about this. But my stuff is if you don't do that, all this other stuff will go, come and bounce back very badly, boomerang badly on you. That's the second. Then the third one is more specifically to the question you ask. But they have to do the first two because otherwise what they're doing is they're rattling a hollow can, hmm. right? They'll make a lot of noise and people will know it's hollow. So, yep. but the third one is what's very important. So there are increasingly new technologies coming around um, of all sorts. So one of them is how do you make absolutely sure that you manage your reputation? And this isn't necessarily just social media monitoring. It's basically how do you think about risk intelligence? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, when someone basically puts out a thing that, you know, this Coca Cola can is poisoned, how do you stop that quickly, figure out, right? Or yeah. something of the sort. So, risk intelligence, and there are companies that work in risk intelligence. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm helping You're an companies. To one, right? I, yeah. I'm an advisor to a company in risk intelligence. The other area that I basically look at is how do you build operating systems that allow companies to easily both provide briefs to, look at the work, and pay influencers. So how do you basically use a system where people can connect and you can both give assignments, look at the work, and pay them? Yeah. Because the idea basically is you may need to get to two, 300 of them to scale, mm-hmm. yeah. while in the old days you could do it just by yourself. So yeah. I advise companies in that space because I think that's another space that's very important. The third area, that people have to figure out. So besides like reputation and how do you leverage scale using, you know, sort of a software as a, you know, as a service kind of thing to do these things. The, the third arena, which is extremely important is how do you provide what I call a scaffolding for people to paint? So, you know, Tom Sawyer made money. So Tom Sawyer had to paint a fence. Right. So what he basically did was he got some paint and he charged people to paint the fence. Yep. Okay. So he provided the scaffolding and mm-hmm. then people came. And so a big part of it is anything that anything like a Coca-Cola or anybody thinks about is they should basically say to every program that they have, how do we make this that we provide assets, frameworks, or platforms for other people to build on what we have done? Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, yeah. And so the idea basically is that the only thing Coca-Cola now does is curate campaigns. They no longer actually start them. Yeah. Okay. They may seed them and hopefully some take off, but that's about how how far they go. And that is, you know, sort of another area. And then to think ahead and the, the way really to think ahead is that one of the big reasons that I am hot on crypto is not necessarily, you know, for every anything outside of the fact that it might find because of decentralized finance and other ways, right. new ways of people getting paid in micropayments without all these taxes and two to three. No, I mean not taxes like IRS right. taxes, but you know other other kinds of stuff. Because in effect, what you want is a decentralized world right. for a creative world to really take off. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's it's interesting. You talk a little bit about the. Brands need to kind of go back to their their core, their roots, right? I think you actually recently read an article on Adweek um, about roots and, and wings, right? Yes. But the thing that I think is so interesting about that is I do I see bigger companies struggling, right? I see them struggling to have a voice, to have a perspective, have a view. And I think they are scared, and I think rightfully so, right? Because once you build this huge empire, you don't want one, one missed tweet to take you down. But at the same time, when you look at the direct-to-consumer trends, 
I mean, yep. these guys, you know, they've popped up, they've disrupted so many markets. And I think one of the big reasons why is when you look at who's founding them, it's millennials and below. And these guys are digital natives for the most part, right? They create their brand that has purpose and passion, and it's effectively a, a reflection of the founder. But they're also created for Instagram, right? They're, they're set up for social media. They're set up to be shared, kind of like your point about Coca-Cola needs to create the scaffolding. I mean, if you put the ready-to-drink market, I think is a big one, right? Where you've got uh, Moscow mules in a can, tequila and a soda in a can. And you've got these beautiful Instagrammable cans where you want to have it as part of your party as a status symbol. You want to take photos with it. You want to share the content. I mean, that that's genius marketing, right? It's, it's free marketing effectively is what it is. Um, so, I mean, I, I see that there, but you know, how do there again, how do these big companies come in and play like that? Right? Like what is, what is Budweiser going to do besides go out and gobble up a whole bunch of ready to drink market companies? Yeah. You know, I, I, it, my, my thing is it's going to be very interesting to see what these, 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 these people do. But I, I, I think that in the future, they're going to have to think about new ways of what a company is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, in, in many ways, one of the big things coming out of COVID is people began to realize that a company is not a building. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And once, and there are a lot of people who basically are scared. So one of the reasons why the big financial companies, some of them, like a JP Morgan Chase or a Goldman Sachs wants all their people back is because if anyone can work from anywhere, people will basically no longer have the cult-like thing that people believe culture. You know, the first four letters of culture are C-U-L-T. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and a cult requires a campus. Hmm. But does Jones it require a, a physical? A physical campus, or could it be a virtual one? It, it can be a virtual. It can definitely be a virtual one. But but these people believe that it's a physical. You know, they they need sometimes a physical sure. campus. But even in a virtual campus, a virtual campus that you begin to have of cults are more like movements, right, mm -hmm. than companies. Mm -hmm. sure. And so companies are really struggling because up to now a company has basically been a place, a hierarchy, and a centralized system, and yeah. we're moving into decentralized finance in the cloud, right? And so a lot of what I also tell these folks is whoever told you that you are a beer company, could it be you're really an entertainment company? Yeah. And the truth of the matter really was that if Budweiser had taken a stake in ESPN when they were helping ESPN launch, yep. mm -hmm. they'd make much more money than selling Budweiser. True, absolutely true. Yeah, that's, it's interesting that you say that because a lot of times what we're advising our clients to do is saying, hey, don't just participate and partner with influencers. Like we want to make you an influencer as well. A creator is probably a better word. Like let's, let's make you an entertainment property on YouTube. Let's build up your YouTube. Let's tell stories. Let's, let's be part of the conversation, right? Brands can be influencers as well. This is not beholden just to individuals, um, especially because brands are, seem to go back to more being almost like they are people. Right, they have they have viewpoints. Um, you know, they engage with with their customers in a lot of different ways. So I can right. I can absolutely see that. Um, hmm. But interesting stuff, right? I mean, that's challenging. It's challenging for a lot of people, and I think a lot of the DTC companies even say, um, or just to go into the Budweiser example. You know, we had the founder of Bev, which is a uh, you know in a can wine, right? It's zero sugar. So she was on the podcast uh, last week, and it was interesting because she created this company out of a movement, right? Not because she wanted to sell canned wine. It was because she wanted to rewrite the, um, the scenario of, of drinking and, and alcohol culture and, and all that sort of stuff. So she was rewriting the script. So she was like, I'm not just gonna do wine. I'm gonna do all of these other things because I am a movement, I am a purpose, right? We are, she's like, I don't even distinguish myself between Bev. You know, when someone referred to it as a brand, she said for the first time, it was shocked her because she's like, what do you mean a brand? It's me, right? Yes, um, yes. And, and, and that's and, powerful. And, and, and exactly. And at the heart of it, whenever someone is doing something, including whether you're a package or product or brand or whatever, I use this word S-A-V-E, which okay. is, are you driving save? So what does save mean? So the S is, 
what solution are you providing? Mm -hmm. So you're defined by the solution, not by what you are doing. So think of the solution. Sure. The other one is how do you make it more accessible? And by making it more accessible may not just be price point, but can be accessed in any form possible. Sure. Then to the point that you know, your friend made, what values do you hold true? What values are you delivering? And the last one, which is increasingly, I think, going back to Instagram and even going back to the way Roblox, the gaming platform, launches yep. itself, is experience, mm -hmm. right? So in many ways, what we are doing in the world that we are is we are actually interacting with, creating with, and living experiences. And the advertising business calls it social, or they call it something right. else. But humans basically call it, we're just connecting to experiences. Right. And, 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 and so the key word I constantly use is, besides save, is connect. We're living in a connected age. Right. We're trying to make connections. How do you connect the dots for innovation? So think about connection. Hmm. That's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. The thing that everything is absolutely connected. There's no, there's no question, no denying that. The thing that I always wonder is, like, what are we connected to? Right. I mean, as humans, you want to connect naturally to other humans, right? And your, your your environment. But the question is, like, are we? We're connecting to things that aren't really real. Yes, uh, things that may not be real. But on the other hand, as someone reminds people, the ninety eight percent of the value of a Adidas shoe mm -hmm. is in the imagination. Okay, so like a two hundred dollar shoe, sure. only four or five dollars are the materials that they put together in China. Sure. Right. The other sure. hundred and ninety five dollars is imagination. Yeah. But I will tell you what is real, and this is why real does matter. And you know, one of the challenges we have all over the world, including America, is people refuse to understand that facts are stubborn things and reality has a habit of breaking in. As mm -hmm. I tell people, you can tweet about it and you can decide that you don't like gravity. You don't believe in it, and you're against it. You sure. jump out of the window, you're going to be dead, my friend. And That's gravity right. doesn't care. So yeah. part of the problem with what we call social media, and there's a downside. Mm -hmm. And the big downside is because of algorithms and because of human behavior, we eventually find ourselves in tribes that are like us or people who like us or people who support us. And so a line I use is we start believing our flatulence smells like Chanel 5. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. And then we trip off into the land imagine, imaginary. So I basically thought about this, and I have advised people, and these are more like leaders. I said, what's the point of what you are doing? Let's ask that, okay? Because sometimes when we're in a frenzy and frenetic, and we, we believe activity is meaning, but activity right. may not be meaning. Sometimes it is if you run and get a runner's eye, but activity itself sometimes isn't meaning, often is not. So what is meaning? And, and I thought about that, and I write about it in my book. But mm -hmm. recently, I've sort of narrowed it down. It says, OK, so let's think about what life is. Let's start with that, because we're alive. And when we're dead, we won't care, right? right. So, so I basically said life is actually about three things. So one is it's about loss. Okay. And so anybody who's alive has to deal with loss. Sure. And there are three kinds of losses you deal with. One is you deal with losses that have to do with you didn't win a soccer game. You lost a new business pitch, right? Mm -hmm. That's number one. Then some deeper losses, which are deeper, is you lose a job. You lose a friend to illness, right? And then the ultimate one is that you are going to lose your life because you're going right. to die, right? So I said, one is there's loss. But what offsets that are two other things, which is learning, right? So life is also about learning. And sometimes loss yeah. teaches us stuff, but life is about learning. Absolutely. But then on the very positive side, life is also about the third L, which is love, mm -hmm. right? And that love is obviously for people, but it's also for things that you are passionate about and hobbies, right? So if you think about it, life is a journey across time in search of meaning, and meaning is often how to deal with life, loss, and learning. 
So I basically say, let's assume that that is what's real. Now, how right. are you going to achieve it? And then different ways people achieve it are different. So they feel sometimes connected using these, right? Huh. So it's yeah. a very simple lie. Life is a journey through time in search of meaning, and meaning often is found in life, loss, and learning, or love, loss, and learning. And that simple thing is what I tell people. If you concentrate on that, and then if you concentrate on something else, which is what makes success, which right. is, again, you know, a lot of people say success is followers or success is money in the bank. Mm -hmm. I say, okay, all of those are interesting, but what is ultimate success? So ultimate success is defined eventually by you. Right. Right? It's not defined by somebody else. You decide what success is. Don't live in other people's minds. But most people will tell you that my definition of success, because it allows everyone to define success the, their own way, is probably a pretty good definition. And so my definition of success, uh, which is not my own definition, but having read a lot of philosophers and read sure. writers, I've taken what some of the best of them have said. And for me, that definition is basically success means you are free to spend your time in the way that gives you joy. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Okay? Mm -hmm. Right? So if you can basically say that I am free to use the time I, the way I want to, right? That yeah. is success. Now you might decide I am very, very wealthy but I love working 24 hours a day because that's what gives me joy. That is success, right? Yeah. Or someone basically says, I can basically on for $50,000 have a wonderful life because I do what I need to do the minimum to make what I need to do. And then I can do the other things, whether it's reading books or taking walks. Yep. That is success too. Absolutely. Okay? And so those are the things that we don't pay enough attention to. And so a lot of what I'm now talking to people, including in my, you know, sort of this thought letter yeah. is, hey, just here's some wisdom to think about. So as we go like running around, have you thought about this? I obviously don't provide answers, but I sure. provide perspectives. And I say, you know, here are things that you may want to think about. And here are some potential people who've got answers that you may want to investigate. Yeah. But that's one of the key things. And that comes down to like, you know, if you look at the name of your company, the social standard. Right. Social is a key part of it, yep. but so is standard. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, and that, that was really the goal, right, in naming the company is that we're here to set the standard in social. Yep. Yep. But now, you know, that's sort of, that changes, and now it's that we're always striving to set new standards, right, be it social, be it digital, be it whatever comes at us, because to your point, it's all gray, and who owns what and who everyone is, we, you know, we just don't know. And even yeah. the definition of an influencer or creator to us is ever changing, it's fluid. And you have to keep up with those times if you wanna to continue to be relevant, you wanna to continue to tell a story. Yeah, and, and that's why these grounding points, like you know, what do you consider to be success? Mm -hmm. What do you consider to be real or life, right? And yeah. then the most important thing, which I think a lot of people eventually figure out, that the people who succeed eventually are who people, for one reason or the other, come to trust. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, they trust their, it doesn't mean I trust you fully as a person, but I might trust your taste. Right. Right. Or I might mm -hmm. trust in this area, I trust you because you have a track record, et cetera. Uh, and, and so you know, in many ways, I've always basically believed a lot of people believe influencers, not because influencers just know how to use social media or influencers right. do cool things, it's because influencers genuinely are often, in, and creators genuinely know what they're talking about for a sub-segment of people and they're trusted. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that's that right there is what has brought the, the niche market, the micro-influencers, all these sort of individual Patreon, Substack style accounts to um, the forefront, right? As that's what people want. They crave the trust, they crave the authenticity. And it's not to say you can't have that if you have a million followers, but it's different. It's just right. there's something different about a smaller person um, doing this. And, and as they become bigger, we'll see how that, that sort of ebbs and flows. But I, I agree with that completely. And I think you're, you're spot on in terms of that definition of success. And I think that sort of navigates me into the, the second topic that I want to chat with you about, which is how employees are really gaining more autonomy in the workplace, right? I mean, even before 2019 happened, um, 
we or 2020 happened, I think we, we were seeing upticks in, in even just the freelancer. I think people are calling it the gig economy, right? And um, Statista said that the number of freelancers in the U.S. economy is going from 65 million in 2020 last year to 90 million in 2028. So that's just eight years, right? And then you fast forward to you know the pandemic and people not being able to go into the office, and we were all part of this like forced experiment to work from home to see how it works. And now you've got people seeing different sides of life and saying, hey, I didn't think this was possible before, and now it is, right? So I think it's only going to continue to propel this autonomy for employees. So my question to you is, how do you how do you see this impacting the American economy in the long run, right? Like, can we be competitive with an out-of-office culture? And I think that's what the J.P. Morgans and the finance guys are saying. But I think, you know, to your point, and a lot about what your book is talking about, is you have to have that human element to balance the technology. Yeah. Technology-enabled humans work, but yes. data with no human action, interaction leaves you in kind of this cold, desolate virtual world. Yep. So... I've thought a lot about this, and I've written three or four pieces on it, which I will sort of summarize. Sure. One of them is called The Future of Work. Mm -hmm. One of them is basically called The Transformed Talent Terrain. Okay. And one of them is basically called The Jigsaw of Return. Okay? Yes, I saw I read so, two of the three. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so those are the three, and so the sort of summarize or distill the first one, which is the future of work, is that all of us, regardless of where we work, are gig workers. Mm -hmm. That's true. And, and yeah. what basically happened is that COVID brought that to light. Yeah, absolutely. And to a certain extent, some companies want to shoo shoo that away. Because, oh, absolutely. Yeah, right? you're supposed to get trust, stability, all those yeah, sort of things yeah, that come but, with but, this but, nine but to five. Basic, but my whole stuff is we're gig workers. It just so happens, like, for instance, I think I was a gig worker, though I kept my gig for 38 years. Sure. Right? And when people think about gigs, they naturally think about l two types of gigs, either lower paying gigs, mm -hmm. like an Uber driver, or right. Grubhub, et cetera, but who, many of whom like the flexibility, but that's one. Or they think about it, our business, which is the advertising, marketing right. sort of infrastructure, the freelance person, you know, the freelance mm -hmm. creative, the freelance Absolutely. producer, the freelance person. But there are other gig workers besides those, which we don't think about, but which are very interesting. Uh, and the way they work is completely gig, but we don't call them gig workers. So that's everybody in the entertainment business. Yeah. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay. Because they basically go from project to project, TV show to TV show, radio to movie to movie, uh, and yeah. they cover out that gig. Sometimes the gig is a month. Sometimes the gig is five, six seasons long. Sometimes it's two months. It's something different. Yeah. And then another group of people who are gig workers are everybody who works at McKinsey and Bain and BCG. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And so you've got these very high paying and very formidable things who are also gig workers. Yep. So, but, but we also think about the fact that our bosses evaluate us every six months or 12 months. Mm -hmm. And if we don't meet criteria, they get rid of us. So, and they will continue to measure us more and more. Sure. Right. So at some particular stage, I basically say, wait a second, the balance of power here doesn't seem to be correct. You do the measurement and I do the work. Maybe <laughs> I should also do some measurement, like yeah. looking at what my options are. And maybe I should be flexible. If you have the flexibility of kicking me out, maybe I should have the flexibility of taking two, three jobs. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and what is beginning to happen is this, that as has happened in the media business, where we unbundled, you know, my, my thought letter is called the future doesn't fit in the containers of the past, right? Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I believe, for instance, I had originally said the compact disc was a container of the past. Now we know the television network is a container of the past. Right. And now I believe that the office is a container of the past. Okay. 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 That doesn't mean there won't be offices, but a person who has to go to office for five days a week, otherwise they're not an employee, 
or cannot rise to the highest level, that idea is gone away, right? And in my book, which was pre-COVID, which is why a lot of people basically said, hey, did you actually write this book anticipating COVID? I have a screen, I have a chapter called Managing the Darker Side of Screens. Yep, absolutely. Right? Which is about why you need to bring people together. So in effect, what I basically say is you now have the best of all worlds, which is a lot of companies will say, hey, look, we love the company to get together, right? For the equivalent of two weeks a year. It might be mm-hmm. a day every day for a quarter where everybody gets together. Because here's what happens is when people come together, you have to get the entire company or the entire team. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no point in getting together. So yeah. that's going to be the very interesting thing. So a lot of companies are going to go to basically two to three days. They're going to basically say one or two days they want the whole company to come together. And then they're going to say the other day teams come together. Yes. And then they're going to say to everyone else, if you're more comfortable working from home or wherever you want, those one or two, three other days, fine. If you want to come to the office, that's fine. But you are adults. Here are some basic criteria we believe. So I do believe the criteria of companies saying, here's this. And so in this jigsaw of return, I talk about companies should put down first principles. We believe we're in the advertising business where we have clients. We think we have to see clients, so we need people to be here. We work in the advertising business, and therefore we believe that we need to find ways to creatively connect. So we need some connection. Therefore, we believe ideally two to three days a week people should come in, mm-hmm. okay, uh, because of these beliefs in our stuff. Someone else basically says our, our company doesn't require that, so we believe these things. So those become very, very important as we move forward in, into the future. And the other one that we are dealing with is if you think about, besides COVID, the two issues we've had a lot to deal with have basically been the issues of diversity right, Mm -hmm. at purpose and values. And my basic belief is, if you want employee joy and you want diversity, you can't force people back into the office because in effect, you are eliminating large portions of the workforce. The group of people who most suffered because uh, besides frontline workers were mothers with kids. Absolutely, I had two young kids, I know it. Mm -hmm. Right, through this process. And so my stuff is, let's ask the mothers with kids if they recrafted this right? And their kids go back to school. Would they like some combination? They want their kids out of school. They want to come to work, right? Right. But maybe they say, do I have to be far away from my kid in my kid's school for five days a week? Right? Maybe there's something else. Have you asked people? So that's the other thing that these people say, you know, it's the way. No, this is not the Maladorian, you know, Mandalorian. There is no the way. You got to ask people. Right. Uh, So I think to a great extent, the organization is changing, and the reason the organization is changing is because the most creative work, coming back even to social, yeah. is done by individuals connected to the cloud. Mm-hmm. Okay, The future city on the hill, the future New York City and Athens yeah. is the cloud. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that completely. And I think it's, it's interesting points that you bring up. I think my... You know, I would say, I, I'd admit, I'd be the first to sort of dismiss the concept of no, no office. And not right. because I feel like I even want to go back to the office personally. Um, I do, but, you know, there are a lot of benefits of, of not doing it. Right. But it's just, I think two things. One, I feel like it's, it's a lot of buzzworthy stuff. And you just see all these articles and ad weekend yep. everywhere because everybody wants to talk about it. So I sort of dismiss it a little bit. Um, but, you know, two is like, you think about companies that are hiring young, junior people. And to me, as a junior person, I've always wanted to be around the people that I worked for um, when I used to work for someone, right? I want to be around people like yourself even, right, constantly so that I can continue to learn and be better and excel myself professionally. And I think it's hard to do that when you are doing everything virtually, right? Like you just just don't know. It's intensely hard, which is why I think the future office literally will be this combination of the real world and the virtual world. Mm-hmm. which will vary based on the following three, four things. And I basically said, everyone will have a different solution based on the following four. One is country and culture. Right. Right. So for instance, China is back to work five days a week. One, because it's a hierarchical culture. Right. But the other is the spaces are too small for people to work from home. 
Okay, so there are there are cultural issues. That's number one. The second one is the type of cooperation that there is. So if you happen to be in the dentistry business, you can't virtually do right. someone's root canal, right? So there's there's right. The third, or you need some interaction in advertising and marketing, etc. The third is the type of talent you have. So for me, talent that is young and needs to be. So talent that's young requires two skill sets, and both require having to deal with people face to face. Mm -hmm. Okay, one of them is simply trading. Yes, which is learning from elders, learning etc. But and that also learning comes from each other, right? Uh, so it's like basically the big thing you learn at the university as people began to realize is not just from the professors, right? But from the other students and being independent and growing up, etc. Right. Those things you have to, you can't do virtually, or it's hard to do virtually. But there's another uh, skill set that a lot of people have to learn. And this is a skill set that actually was already somewhat weak, and that has really suffered, which is soft skills of dealing with people. Right. Okay. So I've always basically believed that I say this facetious, you know, it's, in some ways it's funny, but in some ways it's real. Where I said, where I say everything is easy, but people get in the way. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. So my whole stuff is, I know what needs to be done, but now we got these crazy people who are questioning me. What the hell? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> like, why don't just everybody move away? Why do I have to like convince all of these clouds? Right. I know the way. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. But, absolutely. But, but, right. But you have to deal with people, and the big thing really is, you know, we've now spent eighteen months being able to disconnect. Mm -hmm. hide, close our video screens, or put off our TV cameras and, you know, eat something while pretending we're there. Sure. Right? Uh, that's the big thing, including in the social media world, right? Yeah. Is if you can kind of disconnect someone easily, which you can't in the real world, and, and someone is not a flesh and blood person that you can see them with, you also start not treating people well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so those are the, so, but to me, the future of work is really about combining what we had. So my big belief is companies that decide that the future of work is October 2019 will not be successful in the long run. Right. Right. Companies that basically say, hey, already coming into October 2019, we had technologies that allowed us to do things differently. Now coming out of this, we know both what's great about being together and we also know that work can be done when we are not together. Exactly. So how do we combine that, but combine that both as a company, but also keeping it to mind the different employee needs we have for younger people, older people, mothers, diverse people, et cetera. Because one of the challenges in hiring diverse talent, right? There were many challenges, yeah. but the, there were two very big challenges. One was this we tend to hire we tend to hire replicates of ourselves sure right so you it's the same you problem know. with social media right it's an echo right chamber. so you have yeah. to go looking for people so now there and now there's this whole thing where everybody basically says you should not be filling a job unless you are looking for diverse talent and all things being equal you should try to hire diverse talent it's sure. one of the reasons why amazon has increased their s suite because mm. to a great extent, they didn't have enough women. They didn't have it, right? So they decided sure. they had to do it. So they, they, that's good. They, they keep that in mind. But the other thing that is important is a lot of diverse talent cannot work in major cities and can't work five days a week. Yeah. Right? And so by, you can't talk about diversity and then cut it off. Right? It's like basically saying we want more women, but we don't want mothers. <laughs> <laughs> what's that sure. mm -hmm. yeah right and a reason why so much of these senior people like i try to go now now you know one of my things i wrote this thing called the turn on the table yes, many I senior people mm -hmm. are so 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 smart i've talked to them they're so smart such great people right sure. but nobody talks to them and says why are you thinking like that fool <laughs> right? right and so that they all sing and chat they go to this mass hypnosis these are very intelligent people, but no one is saying like, Jamie Diamond, why are you saying things like that? Because everybody's scared of Jamie Diamond because right. he's brilliant, he's smart, sure. he's great, right? But listen, give us a break. 
you are competing with Square and Afterpay and Stripe, mm -hmm. right? You're not yeah. just competing with Goldman Sachs. Right, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I think those are, those are all great points. And I mean, it will be interesting to see how things happen. I think this is sort of the challenges that we face in the workplace are the same challenges we face in our own personal life, right? It's just a mirror image because even as we are, even if you forget about being virtual, right, with working for the last kind of year and a half, you look at how you spend your time and everyone is on their phone all the time. They can't, they can never put it down. It's, it's an addiction, right? Which I'm sure there's yeah. some good research on that um, <laughs> post pandemic, but that's where people were going in their, in their free time as well. So it's, it's a struggle in your personal life. It's a struggle in your work life, but it's a struggle that also comes with, I, I think it's a beast that if you can tame this beast, you can, to your point of success, create your own freedom. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it is. And so the way I look at it is for people who want to go back to the exactly the way it was, good news, you have that option. Right. Right. And for people who want different ways of operating, great news, we now have that option too, right? And for any company or culture that basically says that they want access to the world's best talent, mm -hmm. you better be flexible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay? Because otherwise you will not get the world's best talent. You because won't. the same person, the very same person for six months might want to basically work all the time at the office and then because of some lifestyle or other challenges, may need to work three months from home. Are you mm -hmm. going to tell the person that, no, you can't do that because they may have a health issue or some other issue? Right. You won't, right? No. You can't. And, and so I've always basically believed if no one is asking to put yourself in a cage, why do you decide to enter a cage? <laughs> right. Yeah, this is what I don't question. understand. Most people basically decide to enter a cage. And my whole thing is, it's the same thing. Like, you know, one of the things I say is, of course you have the freedom not to get vaccinated. Sure. Right? Of course you have the freedom. And the reality today is, if you don't vaccinate because the people who get a vaccine are safe from you, so mm -hmm. if you don't want to vaccinate, that's fine. But you do have that freedom. You have the yeah. freedom not to vaccinate, which, by the way, is the same as the freedom to die. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. you have the freedom to die. Mm -hmm. But I'm basically saying, go ahead. If you want to kill yourself, you have the freedom to do it. Yep. But prior, you better put on a mask because your freedom was also going to kill me. But now in this vaccine world, I am vaccinated. I don't yeah. want to die. Sure. You don't want to. You don't want to have a vaccine. That's fine. If it something doesn't work out, you die. Right. And by basically saying, feel free to die. Right, right? Yeah, is, exactly. is the slogan I would use to get people vaccinated. <laughs> right? We'll give, me, like... give me death. <laughs> Don't vaccine me. Give me death. That's the whole thing that we let's should a, let's set up a Let's set up a merch store. We'll get those right. logos on a t-shirt and we'll see, we'll see uh, if we can get those out there. That'd be <laughs> pretty amazing. I love it. Oh, well, I, you know, I've got to ask you just one more sort of sure. question here. Um, and that's really when it comes to the agency world. Like that's yep. that's the world that you and I live in. That's the world that a lot of our listeners live in. So, you know, we've seen a lot of the same struggles are mirrored here, right? A lot of bigger holding companies have been struggling in the past. You yep. see a lot of these new upcoming um, Sir Martin Sorrell's S4, right? We've got you and Mr. Jones. You've got even boutique agencies like us that are addressing, you know, we've become experts in certain um, segments of, of digital marketing. And we see a lot of brands turning to those directions. So what... What do you think if you were if you were building an agency today from the ground up, a digital agency, how would you go about that um, to create this balanced kind of human data technology thing, but also to really solve the needs of brands today? So I, I would basically do the following five things. Okay. The first thing I would basically do is keep in mind that as an agency, your success will be based on five factors and you need to solve for those five factors. Mm -hmm. And all five are important, but the two that are the most critically important are making sure that you deliver solutions to clients. Yep. Because if you don't have clients, you kind of don't have the business. Right. And second is that you 
attract and retain a unfair share of talent. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So my basic belief is if you can get a disproportionate share of talent yep. who are passionately aligned in serving clients and their goals, right? Those are the two simple, most important. And because of that, the third is how do you manage a culture? So make sure that you understand your clients, get the right talent and manage the culture. Those are the first three C's, clients, yep. you know, culture, and then employees of what people. You want those, uh, those talent. Now to do that, clients, their needs have never changed. So people keep thinking that their needs have changed. Their needs have never changed. Their needs are not, I want more data or I want social, right? Their needs tend to basically be built around, give me insights about people, mm -hmm. give me ideas, right? Yep. Give me things that can help me imagine my business in new different ways so there are these certain things. And then their other needs are, can you deliver effectively and efficiently? Can you make the trains run on time? You know, sure. et cetera. Absolutely. So those are yeah. process effectiveness uh, events. So they, 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 and I wrote this piece called eight, uh, eight Things Clients and Customers Need. And I had written it originally 15 years ago. Okay. And it was called Six Things Clients and Customers Need. And then 15 years later, I called it eight things. So I figured out in 15 <laughs> years, two more things. Sure. And those two more things were not because 15 years of new technology had happened. It was like, oh, I've forgotten two things. 15 years later, I ah. saw there were two other things, okay, which had been true. So that's obviously how to say it. To, to bring it a disproportionate of talent is what you want to basically do is I, when I ran little companies, and I, when I worked for a big company, I s helped, you know, co found or help run three companies which we grew from about three people to 150 people profitably, right? Yes. So not just mm -hmm. grew them, but three times I've done that. And what was very, very clear in doing that was getting talent and basically saying that you were gonna basically make them famous so they could leave. Okay, and most of them never left, okay? Because my thing was, and it's in my book where I'd say, okay, People love you and they want you outside and they're paying you a lot today. Good. Mm -hmm. Come back in six months. Stay here. Come back in six months and tell me if that all those numbers haven't gone up. Okay. If those numbers have gone up, you're working at the right place. You have a 50-year career. What the hell? The next two, three years, you're increasing your market value. Mm -hmm. Right? And so the only reason you want to leave is, A, you have an income that doesn't allow you to basically support your family or pay your bills. Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. Right, not just because someone's paying you a whole bunch of more money. That's number right. one. The other reason you want to basically leave is there is something you don't like the business. You have to leave for a physical reason where you're, you're operating in those old days. You had to operate from somewhere right. where you didn't have an office, etc. Those kinds of things. Or the third and most importantly, but that's not your problem, becomes my problem, is because you think I suck. Right. Okay, and therefore you, you're basically saying, as you suck, Rashad, I gotta leave, right? Mm -hmm. So then you tell me that. Don't tell me you wanna leave the company. Just say that I should leave the company or I should fix fix my thing. But you can keep amazing talent. This is, the talent wars are really about the six things about talent. So anybody talented wants three key things, right? They want money, fame, and power. Yep. Okay, and for young people, it's money, uh, recognition, which is what fame is, mm -hmm. right? And autonomy, which is what power is, okay, right. for them. So give me autonomy, give me recognition, give me money, right? I'm going to come and stay. I'm going to come. But the reason they'll stay is three other things, right? Which is, can I grow here? Mm -hmm. Right? Which is number one. Number two yeah. is, do I believe in the purpose and values of the company? And number three is, do I feel connected to my fellow employees and my bosses? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's how I would fix work on that. So I said, hey, fix fix that. Understand your eight client needs. Fix the six things, and that fixes the culture too. Because if you think mm -hmm. about, and the biggest thing about the culture is get people to speak to the third on the table, which right. is to, where people can tell truth to power is the way your culture works. Because yep. a culture where people can speak up is always a fun culture. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. In, in, yeah. in many ways. So I would do those three. Then there are two others, okay. which are which people have to do today. One is I truly believe that it is impossible for regardless of how large you are as a company, mm -hmm. not to have a very to be able to actually deliver on a client without partnering. 
hmm. so that every company has to figure out how to partner. So what I mean yeah. by this is, let's say a client hires you, right, to help them with their social and everything else, and you yeah. do that. You can deliver that, but you can deliver it even better if you find ways to partner with their other agencies or their other partners, Absolutely. right? Your yeah. product will be much better. The client will be much more happier because they won't have to babysit a bunch of crybabies who are trying to grab everybody else's candy, okay? <laughs> right. uh, and, and, and so to, to, the whole idea is you have to, we, you have to be API friendly, which yep. is, I do this really well, but I'm going to connect with everybody else that I possibly can. Exactly. That doesn't mean there won't be, you know, the little demilitarized zone problems, et cetera. But that's the, the, the clients like people who connect yeah. well with their other partners, connect with their other colleagues. So that's the, the thing I would do. Mm -hmm. And then the problem last solvers, right? Problem solvers. And then the last one, which is the more newer one, is make sure that you are continuously upgrading your mental and technological operating systems. And that's okay. the more modern one, which is, do you have the skill sets that you need and do you have the partners that you need for the modern world? That's what the clients are now asking. So one of the things that clients ask is, is my current incumbent agency, do they have the skill sets and the talent and the agility to do these new things? Sure, yeah. Right? Uh, or are they still beholden to the past? But really what they're asking is they're not really asking about, do these people understand the technology? They're really asking is, do they have the talent that can help me, right? Do they have the culture that allows their talent to help me? Do they understand what my needs are? So those first three questions is really what they're looking at, okay? Mm -hmm. But they're doing it under the lens of, this is something, a new technology, this is about data, this is about a platform age. They're looking at that. Sure. But what they're really looking at is, I need someone to help me to solve my problems or you know, unleash some new potential for me. Sure. And I'm going to go to the people who can do that. And I will try as hard as possible to see if my existing companies can do that. But if my existing companies can't, I'll go to other companies. And the more those companies work with my existing companies happily, the more I like them. And one of two things will happen. They will get more business from me because these areas are going to grow. Or they will build additional skill sets and I will give them other pieces of business. Yeah. Or I will tell my big company to buy them and make them rich because they need those skill sets at the other company. Absolutely. Absolutely. That last one really rings true for me. So yeah. <laughs> I, I think those are spot on. I mean, it's we have seen firsthand almost every single one of those situations arise. Yeah. Um, and I will say that to, I think, you know, my team's credit is we've gotten so good at the influencer marketing piece that we've been blacklisted by larger agencies. They won't work with us because we've taken business from them. Not that right. we've gone out to seek it to say, hey, you know, screw you guys, but more that it's been handed to us because because of that. Right. Um, and, and, and what happens is it's you have to live it. See, the, the big thing that I, which I buy, which is why I keep telling folks this uh, or suggesting folks, you know, they said like, how come you're learning all these new things? Like nobody told me to go learn Substack and start all of this stuff, right? right? Yeah. But when I now speak to people about these things, they pay, actually, they say, you're not as stupid as you look. You actually are still trying. I said, <laughs> yeah, I'm still trying. And just, and by the way, that is one of the key things yeah. where actually I don't have clients anymore, but you know, people will say, if I said, hey, I, I'd like to help you on this. Yeah. They, they will basically say, okay, you're over the hill, you're useless. They'll say, you're still trying, we'll give you a chance. Okay. Right. Because they want, see, I don't think most people realize most people would like their existing partners to continue to be their partners. Absolutely. Nobody wants to like dump people, right? Nope. But their base stuff is, can you focus? Can you learn these new skill sets? And if you can't, I'm not waiting around. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and why would you? Right. You can't. You cannot wait. This I no, mean, digital social, it moves so fast. You wait around, you're done for. Right. And and, so. and part of this is this is and this is the only thing where I basically it's not an age thing because I'm obviously older, but it's something that I do tell my colleagues of my age or the generation immediately after me, is I said, you know, we get into trouble not because of the talent we have in the organization, we get into trouble because of ourselves, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And I said, what happens is we stop learning. Yeah, right? absolutely. You and the do client that. doesn't believe we get it because we are the people talking to our clients while there are people actually in our organization who might get it, but we're not putting them in the front or we're not learning these new things. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. And so to a great extent, the future doesn't also fit in the mindsets of the past. Yeah, that's definitely uh, true. And, and it's one of the reasons, and therefore I've tried to balance this, which is like, you know, some say, well, you know, we've got all this like learning, et cetera, which is part of why I wrote Roots and Wigs. Yeah, which right? I loved. I thought so was great. So where, mm -hmm. where I basically said, hey, I buy Roots. Yeah. But, but you also need Wigs. You know, mm -hmm. Wigs alone don't make sense, but you need Roots and Wigs. Absolutely. And it's kind of, you know, to your point around the vaccinations, it was, I'll see if I can misquote you here, but yeah. it's, it's your right to die, right? It's, if you yeah, want you, to learn. You, 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 you have the right to die. Please yeah. go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not making my day because I don't want anybody to die. But, of course. But, but in effect, at this particular stage, if your decision only hurts you and your loved ones, who you also may not have vaccinated, right? right. And it, your decision basically allows right, you to be fooled by people like Tucker Carlson, you deserve sure. it. <laughs> well, I think, but, is, but you, right. can, you, know, you can apply that. To anybody, to any side. In any, and to anything, yeah. right? Vaccines, yeah. vaccines, whatever. Right. Like life, general learning, it, it, that, that's, it, it, this it, applies it, it, there. It's, it's like, but the stuff is, you know, we, we try too hard to get other people to like do things. And my stuff is, look, I'm doing this for this reason. You can do what you want. And as long as what you do sure. doesn't hurt me, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, we can't do that. But by the way, do realize that science doesn't care about your tweet. Okay, that's, that's what people, my whole stuff is like, they don't care. You billion yeah. followers, jump out of the 26th floor, you're dead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes people need to see that, you know, you got, you got to remind yourself that you're not, you're an above things. I used to say that, you know, uh, feelings are not facts. Yes, exactly. Right. But, uh, but, but what tends to basically happen is that, so my book basically sh sort of indicates is while we live in this data-driven digital silicon age, we are carbon-based analog feeling people. Absolutely. Right? And so how do we actually, so what I try to do is I try to bring facts to feeling or feeling to facts because we, we are a combination of facts and feelings, roots Definitely. and wings, one plus two, you're completely correct. Uh, but sometimes we become so feeling oriented that mm -hmm. we go crazy. But at the same stage that my book wards, sometimes we become so data crazy that we miss everything. Absolutely. It's a balance, right? We're all yeah, just it, trying to, to strike the balance. It, 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 it's, 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 abs it's absolutely that balance. Very cool. Well, hey, this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, well, I really you. appreciate you coming on. And for our listeners, if you have not yet checked it out, please go check out Rashad's book, Restoring the Soul of Business, Staying Human in the Age of Data. And Rashad, just one more question, if you'll humor me here. Um, because we are an influencer company, I've got to know who is one influencer who's had a big impact on your life? They don't need to have a million followers on Instagram. As we've discussed, influencers are everywhere. So there are uh, you know, three influencers who I follow a lot. All three are well-known. Uh, you know, all three are women. Okay. Uh, and this may be because I have two, you know, two grown-up daughters and a wife, sure. so possibly that, but these are three. So... The, the person who I believe is one of the smartest business people and who is an influencer is any of the Kardashian sisters. A thousand percent. I could not agree with you more, okay. and I say this and, all the time. And, mm -hmm. and, and my stuff is these are people who are smart, very smart business people, creators. Absolutely. Right? They're not just famous for being famous. That might have yeah. been that force, but that's not true. That's one. Uh, the other one on how they use the media mm -hmm. and how they do this is AOC. Yeah, okay. yeah, uh, that's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, for somebody who knows, I mean, if you want to basically talk about somebody who understands how this world works, you know, I would basically say it's AOC. And then a third is actually a journalist. And she's a journalist who's very brave, has broken a lot of uh, things on like social media on Facebook. Her name is Ka Carol Caldwelder. Okay. She works for The Guardian in, cool. in Britain. Um, and she's worth sort of looking at. And those three, so it's very different. You know, one in politics, yeah. one in journalism, and one in business slash entertainment uh, uh, are those three. And they're, they're prolific. They're very different. Uh, they span the gamut. If you put they them do. in a room, they probably wouldn't get along. 
but <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> uh, know, it's 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 worth looking at. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, and I think sense. it goes back to you know that that sort of gets every, gets you maybe outside of your comfort zone with the Kardashians, right? But that yeah. contributes to learning and it contributes to contributes to a balanced perspective, which is basically what your book is about, right? It is, and one of the things I'll, I'll tell you that I I suggest to people. In addition to saying, okay, look, look at my book, it'll help you. If you can't afford my book for free, you go to rashad.substack.com. You can read that or you'll come across my stuff because, you know, Media Village, Ad Week, all of them sure. now are like republishing it, which is great for me uh, and for other people. But the other thing that I say is use media in ways that allow you to have the people work for you. So just in my or Twitter, I've created lists. Yeah. Right. So I basically have like voices and curators, brain food. Right. So I actually when I need curators and I have right wing, left wing, all kinds, yeah. I click on them and I have some of the best voices talking to me. Right. So my whole stuff is if there is one thing that I would leave people with is there's never been a more wonderful time to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. And you can do it by yourself if nobody else is helping you. OK. And so what I want people to realize is the future is much brighter and much more optimistic that they should stop fearing the headlines and just go on growing and believe in themselves. Absolutely. I think well put. That's, a, that's the perfect way to um, to cap the, the episodes, a little little bit of optimism. Well, so wonderful. Well, Rashad, again, it was a pleasure talking to you. I appreciate fantastic. it. And we will absolutely be following you on Substack. Sure, you bet. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.